this little presentation here on this beautiful Monday morning is on AC compressor basics and some actuators and stuff. Um, I'm talking about more of the compressors here actually. I got some other stuff I'm going to cover too. But um, let's jump into this thing. You know, the systems used to take a heck of a lot more refrigerant than they do now. Uh, back in the old R12 days, sometimes three, four pounds you'd have to put in there, particularly if you had a front and rear unit. You still have to put a pretty good bit in there if you're working on a big SUV that's got a rear AC unit and all. Interesting thing about a rear AC unit a lot of the times is that they have a, uh, even if it's a fixed orifice type system, they'll still have a dedicated expansion valve for the rear evaporator. Yeah. It'll have, it'll have, you know, refrigerant piped back there from your existing compressor system and all. I drove a 67 Chrysler New Yorker I talk about sometime whenever I was uh, right out of high school. And that thing had heater hoses going through the car to a heater core in the back that was underneath the package tray. And that was to defrost the back glass. It was a real unusual, peculiar way of doing something. That was a 67 model car unusual. It had tilt and telescope steering wheel, automatic headlight dimmer and all that. Um, <laughs> that automatic headlight dimmer was kind of funny because it sort of looked like a rig gun sitting on the dash. Uh, but it's a, if you could do, move this little lock ring in the middle of the uh, steering wheel with a telescope too. Um, anyway, if you look right here, you basically, this is a whole system. It's real pretty. It's like what you'd find in a little Crown Victoria. You know, you got everything there. Uh, just that you can see, you know, your condenser being here, your compressor evaporator is out of sight in here, but the blower motor is right there. See, they just put everything on a really neat package right on that side of the engine compartment. You know, all. So, anyway, so here's the thing, what you got, and i got to turn around so you can see the whole screen here. A thermal expansion valve versus an orifice system, rule of thumb is, typically if you got a, a fixed orifice, you're, you're going to have an accumulator and the uh, fixed orifice is going to be in the liquid line. Now on some of the Chevrolet pickups, and I never really understand this, they would put this orifice way out there behind the grill right close to the evaporator. I mean, I'm sorry, right close to the condenser, which was really weird to me. Uh, and furthermore, whenever you had to take the grill off, which wasn't that hard, but you take the grill off to get to that thing to pull that orifice out of there and look at it, a lot of the time the threads would gall when you went to take those lines loose and it would just you know, you'd wind up having to replace the uh, condenser and the line and all that. would be a big pain. But thermal expansion valve systems will have a receiver dryer in this line here. Like that one there. See how I drew that? Now I drew both of these, so you're not going to find these anywhere else online unless somebody has stolen from me. Um, as a matter of fact, I had these components put on a paper without the lines connected. And, and whenever I was giving my students... Uh, final exams, one of the things they had to do was draw this the way it actually was connected and I'd have the components, you know, arranged slightly different. Uh, but I did this uh, yesterday. I put all of these, uh, you know, drew all the lines in here. And I'd actually drew the components on Microsoft Paint too. But the point is, you can see the difference between, you know, this accumulator basically has some oil and liquid refrigerant in it all the time. And it's, got, it's fixed so that no liquid refrigerant can make it through this to the compressor because you can't compress liquid and it'll destroy the compressor. This is the discharge line that's got high pressure gas in it. And this is actually condensing the high pressure gas into a liquid and then it runs back through that liquid line which is a small line, you know, see it's not bigger. And when it gets to the fixed orifice, it sprays it in there as a low pressure liquid so that it can evaporate and absorb heat. So it gives off heat here, the refrigerant does, whenever it's condensing and, and it's used, this is usually mounted right in front of the radiator which I always wondered about the wisdom of that and I'll talk about some uh, other uh, some platforms that didn't do that or that you know changed it in a minute on another slide but anyway so you got a fan pulling air through this and you got a fan blowing air through that and that basically is how that all of that works now this one here a lot of the times they'll have I have seen them. One of the problems that you have is is this will ice up if you don't do something to keep the to keep it from happening. Now on, on this system here, you've typically got a low pressure switch, and that low pressure switch will be mounted somewhere over here. You, sometimes it'll be mounted in this, 
uh, and it'll actually open, it'll cycle a, a compressor and temperature are so closely related, it'll cycle a compressor as the temperature, I mean as the pressure drops below like 25 pounds or whatever. Uh, some of those switches were kind of adjustable. I had one on a Lincoln one time where that low pressure cutout switch was going, tit, 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 you know, clicking the machine gun in the compressor clutch. And if you unplug the connector down in there between the two terminals, there was a screw that you could adjust it. And I, I turned that screw a little bit and adjusted it for a, to a different setting and it stopped doing that. I thought that was an interesting. Never saw that but once though. But anyhow, so here you've got this receiver dryer. It's got desiccant in it. If this desiccant bag breaks in this thing, it'll fill the whole darn thing up. And this right here, if that receiver dryer is one of the kinds that will allow that to happen, all of those desiccant granule things can get all in there too and make a big mess out of all this. Uh, so, one way or another, <clears throat> that's really important. It's also, it's got a tube that goes down in here to keep liquid refrigerant from getting in here, but the bottom of that tube with a screen on it, there's a hole drilled in that tube so that oil can go in there and it oils the compressor kind of like a chainsaw gets oil from the gas that you mix with oil. Alright, so there that is. A, the, uh, sometimes the receiver dryer will be mounted on the side of the condenser and I'll tell you about that in a minute too. Now, this is a subcooler. You might notice this right here. On a lot of these vehicles now, they don't tell you it's a subcooler, but I suspect that it is. This is mounted on the side. There's a separator right here, and you know, see this right here. This, the lower part of that thing, will be the subcooler. So what it does is, it takes this high pressure gas, and it turns it into a high pressure liquid. And after turning it into a high pressure liquid, it's able to go through this. There's your dryer right there. You know, you know, that sock you can change out of these. A lot of these, I could have made pictures of that, but I, I mean. I took, I've got pictures of it that I took, but you've seen them before. Alright, so this cat passes through into this lower portion where there's a separator. See, there can't, no, this refrigerator can't make it down there except by going through that dryer. So it has to go through the dryer to get to the subcooler portion. So you've got liquid refrigerant leaving this, but it's cooler than it is. You might notice how you would feel the uh, liquid line would get really, really hot. You remember how that would happen? And so on these right here, the liquid line doesn't get quite so hot. And then, like I say, they, they're put these, they put this orifice in various different places. One of the things I thought was very interesting, I should have put a picture of this, is on some of them uh, OO and up uh, GMC and Chevy trucks, they would put the low side and the high side charge fittings on the same piece of pipe with the orifice in between them. I thought that was downright weird, but it works, I guess. Anyway, this is cool high pressure liquid refrigerant. Now, on the Hondas and some Dodge trucks, and I thought this was pretty slick. I like the design of this, if there's room to do it. The condenser is over here, the radiator is over here. Now, this radiator's got a couple other heat exchangers in front of it. One of these be transmission, the other power steering, or whatever. But this condenser here had a dedicated fan, and the radiator basically had nice cool air coming into it, instead of having hot air coming out of this condenser going into the radiator. You know, and uh, Honda and Dodge, this is a Dodge truck here, but these Honda and Dodge trucks uh, is, are not all Hondas, but some Hondas. And I don't remember exactly which ones, but I've seen it on a bunch of Hondas, and I really like the design. I think it's a good idea. Uh, one early type of 1234YF, these other ones were like R12 and R134 systems, which R12 systems are just about all gone now. I know several people that have entire cases of one pound cans of R12 they saved when they were R12, you know, got to where they weren't making it anymore. And if you want R12 nowadays, all you can get is recycled R12, which is super, super expensive. And for what? You know, you can, it's real easy to convert an R12 system to an R134 system if you know how to do it. Uh, falling off a log, you know, one guy said it was about as easy as that. But you notice the, the interesting thing about the, one, the 1234 system that's pictured here, and several of them are made like this. There is a heat exchanger right here, that, com that compact internal heat exchanger right there. Okay, so you got a condenser out here behind the radiator like you were talking about before or in that front where it's catching the wind coming in with a fan pulling across it. And then you got an evaporator, but look at this, uh, how interesting that is. That heat exchanger right there is something you don't see on these other systems. And I had heard talk one time of them actually taking some uh, some other kind of liquid rather than refrigerant and letting the refrigerant cool this 
and run it through the evaporator so that you wouldn't have this flammable 1234YF going inside the car. Of course, 134 is a little bit flammable too. A lot of refrigerants are flammable, so you know. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that. So you're going to have a pneumatic or electronic control variable compressor. They're talking about the thickness of these condensers and all there. <laughs> Tube and center or plate type evaporator, you know, so on and so forth. But that extra heat exchanger is what I thought was very interesting about the 1234 system. Now on the compressors, you got the swash plate, you got your variable displacement, so this can change. It's kind of like this one, except it's whenever this is vertical, you've got no compressor activity, and this one doesn't have. It's interesting to me, this one shows a clutch, but most of them that have a variable displacement, this was at the Ranshu booth at a Max convention where I took these pictures. But the fact that most of the ones that have this variable swash plate, that, you know, the variable displacement, they mostly they don't use a coil, a clutch coil, like this one shows. I thought that was interesting too. Uh, scroll type compressors, you know, they're a, they basically got two scrolls that work inside one another. Uh, now, the swash plate compressor, I had one I took apart there at the shop. I've got another video on my channel about this, but you can watch this. When I'm spinning this shaft with a drill, it's cool to watch what those pistons do. All right, let me get that back on there. See how the pistons going back and forth? That's what a swash plate compressor does when it's spinning. And what you have in order to make it work, if you walk around here, you look at these, uh, we took these ends off it. It's got these little flutter valves uh, that work with these holes in these plates. And that's one of the things that makes those that compressor work like it does. It's a very intricate design. Uh, and it's, you know, somewhat expensive to manufacture, apparently, although you don't have to pay a whole lot usually to get those. That's this type of compressor right here. Now, the variable displacement compressors use an internal piston and a solenoid to change the angle of the swash plate on the fly instead of disengaging and re-engaging the clutch. And a lot of times they'll have these little breakaway things in the clutch so that if something happens, it will, you know, break loose. And the belt spins that all the time and spins the shaft all the time on those. But if it's, again, if it's vertical, the pistons aren't moving, and so you're not compressing anything. Now, that one just got pistons on one side. All right, so they've got a rotary valve in the rear of the compressor that's, electro, of some of them, electromagnetically controlled to feed refrigerant pressure to a special chamber. Some of them use refrigerant pressure that's, you know, that's triggered with a solenoid and with a little magnetic valve to change the angle of that thing. All right, so scroll-type compressors. Uh, you know, they work within, they got two scrolls working within it. You see the little valves right there, the little flutter valves. But they fail more than piston type compressors in my experience. I've seen more of these die. And they're usually pretty darn expensive too. Uh, the, the scroll type or co typically cost more than a swash plate type. Now, cabin air filters have again been more common since about 1995 when they appeared on the Ford Contour. Uh, that's a really good idea to keep that pollen and stuff out of the car and the dust and all that kind of thing. Um, Teslas have got, uh, some of them have got a great big massive cabin air filter on the outside that's just gigantic and then they got another one inside the car so they're running it through two filters before it gets inside the car. Um, I actually wrote a course for Cars on Demand on that. Um, incidentally, some of these right here are behind the glove box. Some of them are out here under the hood. You just got to find out where it is. On the Nissan ones, it's really interesting because uh, some of these Nissan Altimas have got one that's right up against the bulkhead on on the you know what right in the middle, right in the center under the dash, and you've got a little opening that's only about half as big as the filter, and when you grab the filter, it accordions together and you pop it out of there, and then when you get another Nissan brand filter, you accordion it back together and stick it in there, it goes boom, pops out into shape, but. If you buy filters for these from the parts store, they come as two small filters. You stick one in and it drops, and you stick another one in and it, it goes on top of it. And, you know, and, and actually, uh, I think the Tesla 3 is set up similar to that. And, and all. But uh, anyway, this is like 25 microns is usually what it is. Some of the Lexus vehicles will have horseradish impregnated into these filters to kill bacteria. Some of them, some of the Lexuses have. Um, ultraviolet lights shining on the filters to kill the bacteria, which I thought was a very interesting deal too. Um, if you have a van, like a Montana van or something, uh, that is, uh, doesn't have a lot of airflow, then open the glove box, reach in there and pull that cabin air filter out, you'll probably find it's all clogged up. 
Now, just about all vehicles today, and this is a very simplified, you know, schematic of airflow control. You know, it's basically the register is in your face, defrost is up here, and they uh, these older ones basically had a uh, a two-stage uh, vacuum diaphragm that could stop this in the middle, or they could move it there, or they could move it there, and uh, then there's your floor. See, that actually opens and closes, and then you got your inside air. You know, this actually closes off the heater core, lets it go through the heater core if it wants it to, or it shut, blocks the heater core off if all you want is cool air, so on and so forth. And then here's your your recirc and uh, your norm. Uh, believe it or not, if you're driving a vehicle on a long trip, you'll get better fuel economy on max air than you will on norm because norm is air, uh, air conditioning the outside air and max is re-air conditioning the inside air. So keep that in mind too. Um, I told that to a friend of mine. He didn't believe it until he drove to Atlanta and back and he, he ran it on norm going up there and on max coming back and he noticed a significant improvement in gas mileage running it on max on a long trip. But a lot of these uh, little things have got actuators with electric motor and little plastic gears. You've got a feedback potentiometer so the control head can determine where the doors are and when, if they're even working. And uh, a lot of the times whenever you uh, like on some of the older, like Eagle Premiers and stuff, you know, you basically have to do some stuff to cause it to go back and forth and figure out where the doors were and how it needed to stop them and all that. It, re it reads current uh, and it basically knows whenever the current starts to increase it, it's the end of travel and then it goes to the other end of travel. A lot of them operate that way. Now this S-Class Mercedes system has 10 AC servo control motors, which is a lot of motors on this doggone thing and there's the name of all of those things. <laughs> it's just really interesting how they cram all that stuff on there and they got all electronic. It was also interesting to me how they would have a, they'd be on a, uh, a bus system that would be running through uh, all of those things like in series and they had it going from the controller through all of them in series back to the controller and that way if the wire was damaged or if a controller went offline all the other uh, little um, actuators would still work, you know, because they were getting uh, information from both sides. Now, a lot of the time, whenever you have these, you, you, you may have all of them will have the same actuator, but whenever you plug the connector in, it programs that thing so that it knows exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, for years on the Volkswagens, you would have the same control head on every vehicle, but you had to program the control head for what vehicle you were putting it in or it wouldn't work right. If it was the same one went in a Passat as went in a Vanagon, you know, the van and all that from, and I, I learned that at Mobile Air Conditioning Society training and all that. They were talking about how you have to go in there your scan tool and tell it that you're putting this control head, even though it's the same part number, you're putting it, you know, in a car, which car you're putting it in, which van you're putting it in, so on and so forth. You know, that's an interesting thing too. Now, stepper motors on a Mercedes S-Class have one power feed, several separate grounds, and they basically, you know, they, they walk this voltage so that it, 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 it turns it. And you might notice that you've got a little chart here and all that. Uh, Chrysler and GM air, idle air control motors pretty much do the same thing. But a stepper motor doesn't just whirl and whirl. It basically turns on little, it turns little steps, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And they're basically taking these and you're doing that with them or you're doing it the other way if you're turning it back the other way. And it's interesting how those stepper motors work. Now, all the actuator motors in the air conditioning system are of identical design as what I was talking about earlier. The task and the assignment of the flap to be actuated takes place in the wire harness coupling. When you plug it in, there's jumpers in there uh, that jump certain pins together so that the, the actuator knows what it's supposed to do. But it's pretty cool they came up with a way to use the same... Uh, part number on all of those different ones. So if you've got one, you got them all. Just move it to a different place, plug it in, and there you go. And, um, now a number of uh, inexpensive no-frills vehicles uh, have an electronic blend door actuator. Why is that? Well, the electronic blend door actuator enables you to set the temperature between cold and warm any way you want to. You can do that with a stepper motor, but it's hard to do that with a vacuum servo. So basically, if you even though even though everything else on the vehicle, like for example that '98 Ford Ranger that I had for a trainer vehicle, 
it had a uh, blend door actuator, electronic blend door actuator, so that it would, uh, and it was up there behind the glove box. And whenever you were able to, you were turning the uh, knob for cold to warm, it could stop that blend door anywhere it wanted to. And that's really important to be able to do that. Back whenever uh, my mother was living, she had a, a, there was, this friend of mine bought a, and this was a long time ago, but he bought a uh, Sony uh, video camera. And he had one of these big coax leads that hooked to it and all that kind of stuff. And it was black and white video camera, a big old Sony thing. Bought it for $3 from a garage sale. Sold it to me for $3. And I, I built a bracket for that thing. And I used an old AC blend door actuator that I hooked it up so that you could just reverse the polarity like a windshield motor and make it go back and forth. And I wired that thing up so it was pointing at my mother's garage out there. And in the kitchen, she had a little television in there. And I wired up a little toggle switch, one of these toggle switches that spring-loaded to the middle and, you know, it worked kind of like a power window switch. And um, she could go from A to B on a video switching box. And when she'd be watching her news program or whatever on TV, she could flip that little TV in the kitchen over to, over to B, and she would have a, v a view of her garage out there. And then I had it wired it up so that I mounted that thing on the bracket. I made the, the, the turning force was provided by a little blend door actuator that I had in my toolbox. It was just a junky one that still, the little motor and the gears and all still work, but something else was wrong with it. So I wired that thing up so she could use that toggle switch to pan that camera back and forth and get, and to see who all was in the, who was in the garage if there was somebody out banging on the door. You know, she lived in a neighborhood where there was a lot of riffraff and all at the time. Uh, she chose to live there well, because she didn't have a choice. But the point is, I put all that in place, spent all that money buying wiring and wiring it from her kitchen out there to the garage and all that and, and had that video coax run in there and it was just a beautiful system. Like I was like, wow, you know, this is like professional. You know, you can pan that thing around, look at the door. You could look out there and see who was coming in or whatever. And um, it worked for three days and then the camera died. <laughs> using a used camera was a bad idea. <laughs> anyway, there's almost as many different types of door actuators as there are vehicles. You can see all different kinds of these up under there. I mean, just, and they've all got a little motor and they got little plastic gears in them and all that. But, uh, on these plug and play, some of them you just plug and play, some of them you have to learn. Uh, if you're going to replace this control head, for example, on a GM or a Chevrolet pickup, like this one right here, you got to turn off the switch, disconnect the scan tool, install this module, connect all previously disconnected components, start it up, wait 40 seconds for the HVAC control unit to self-calibrate. What it's doing is it's driving them things back and forth so it knows where they are and it knows where to put them and all that. I usually waited 60 seconds to make sure, verify no DC, no DTCs are set, this permanent DTC. But I mean, that enables it. Now, these things right here, you can get rebuilt ones, you know, they don't cost all that much, but it's getting, uh, it got really hard to get these for a while there. I was actually buying them through Advanced Auto Parts, but you can get them other places too. And they usually cost about $100 through Advanced Auto Parts or whatever. But anyway, you're, you're driving, you're up, your mode doors are here, and then you're cold and warm, you got two sides of that, and then the copy of your fan and all. There's your recirc. That's where you turn on your AC, and that's your your defrost, but anyway, on GM systems, the potentiometer is either driven by or integral to the output shaft. This one here is actually integral to the output shaft controller. Uh, so that see that little wiper on there that's wiping here that goes here, and that's how it knows where that thing is. Some of them have got a little pot that's built on it as one of the gears, uh, not the one going out, but another one. See that one actually goes to your door right there. Uh, but a lot of the times on these, these little uh, teeth will break off of some of these gears and what you'll wind up with is you'll wind up with the uh, control head trying to go click, 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 click. I mean, it'll try to move it. One of the common ones on some of your Impalas over there behind the dash or research door, I think it was, would make tick, 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 and tick for a while and it quit ticking. Um, one of the things that was always scary about uh, those actuators is some of them are doggone hard to get to. Uh, but Anyway, it's, uh, it is what it is. You know, they're using this, this uh, cheap plastic stuff to do it. And somebody drops a pencil or something down in there, goes down in through your defrost, it gets there and fouls one of those doors. Occasionally, you'll have a busted door. 
Uh, like my son's truck's got a research door that's busted so that it's always on norm all the time and he has issues. That's on his 2013 F-150. This is how this thing is wired up. You know, there's your potentiometer right there. And there's your motor. And basically you can see how this thing right here is, is going out there and powering those motors. That's the air temperature right and left. And the rest of that schematic is a recirc actuator and a mode actuator which goes defrost, floor, register, you know, whatever. Or mixtures in between those. And these right here basically, if you notice, are just little contact switches. Okay, they got a controller in here. It's a logic box, logic module. And all that. And so uh, that's this is what you're dealing with whenever you're looking at one of these things right here. See, it's got all that stuff in it typically. And uh, all right. Now on the actuator pins on your GM motors. I learned this from a guy that worked for GM. Uh, you got five volt reference, position signal, low reference, which is a ground. This is like your signal return, and that's like your reference voltage. Then you got ignition voltage. So your ignition voltage. Right here, there's your control signal, uh, and then your, you know, position signal zero to five volts right there. Now, watch what we're going to do here. You notice this one here. This pin's missing. It's not used on those. But so you got three pins, and you got two pins, and that one there's not used. All right. So you can diagnose the actuator concerns from the right-hand instrument panel fuse block on mid up to uh, mid to late 2000s model C and K trucks. So you remove the right IPO trim cover, you see them, see those connectors right there, right? Alright. Now, this right here is this connector, and this one is that one, and this one is that one, right? So these are the connectors we're most concerned about right here. Okay. Now, uh, this fuse box, this is IPC5, which is that connector right there. Alright, and so this is how it's pinned out, right? Mode door position, mode door control, left air. If you know that, then you can do this without ever pulling anything except that cover. If you've got your, uh, your voltmeter, your fuse jumper wire, uh, and all that. So this one here is your, this one here gives you uh, what, what those pins do. That's your lower left air temperature sensor signal, and all of these are voltage. Right temperature air door, uh, control, position signal, so on. All right, now this is, this gives you all of that laid out really pretty. You can pause that if you want to. Uh, make sure that this is this little code right here, you might want to notice that. You see that? CJ2? That's the IPO code on that little sticker you got in the glove box on the GM vehicles. Got all the little things on it. You got to have one. That, this is for the CJ2, right? So if you got some other IPO code for that truck, it may be different. All right. So you're, look at what we're doing here. Applying low reference to the air inlet control circuit will drive the motor counterclockwise. See that? But you actually, having looked at these, you, you can tell that low reference signal. In other words, if you ground that control signal, uh, it basically is going to drive it one way, and if you put 5 volts to it, it's going to drive it the other way. See? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Alright. So, what you're basically doing is, your low reference to control. See? You've got to have a 3 amp you know, jumper if you're going to do it right. All right, now watch this. If you put five volts to that control signal, it drives it clockwise. All right, see that again? This drives the, the actuator counterclockwise, and this drives it clockwise. See, so basically low reference would be your, that's the ground, that's like signal return. All right, now you can actually go here between your low reference and your position signal and monitor the voltage to see if it's changing. I used to show my students how to do that. And uh, that way you can see if it's do, going through its full sweep or not. Compare one of them to the other and all that. Monitor your position while driving it with a fuse jumper. You know, back and forth while you're watching that. You know, you can do that. Or you can, you know, go this way and monitor it too. See, every time you're monitoring it either way, you can see which way it's going and all that. You can also use the scan tool or the actual knob, knobs on the controller, and monitor the voltage if you know which pins to go to. Once again, that's what the pin out for back probing is on those things right here. Uh, you can check the status of the circuits behind that right hand instrument panel by measuring each one on the ground. You know, in other words, if you've got, you shouldn't have any of those wires, shouldn't be directly shorted to ground. Now, obviously, that one there is going to show a ground. 
which are, you would expect it to. But if any of these other ones are shorted to the ground, it's not going to work right. So, know what kind of system you have. Know whether a scan tool will be needed. Know how to read a wiring schematic. Know some of the actuators are difficult to access. Know whether or not the actuator and or control head must be reset. If you just pop it in there, you don't know. This one guy that uh, when I went over there one day to visit at the Ford place after I had been started teaching, this one guy had, was trying to put a, uh, you know, the, the window motor that raises and lowers the rear glass in these Explorer Sport tracks. Um, that thing had quit working back there. And so he just went to the part that ordered a, the motor and he just plugged it in and he tried to operate the switch and it wouldn't work and he was frustrated by that, didn't know what to do. And so I went and looked it up and it basically said you were supposed to, uh, to begin with, uh, unhook the battery, mount the motor like it was supposed to be mounted. And then you get in there and switch on the key and you push that, uh, but, I mean, that little knob on the dash that control that back glass seven times, I think, and then it would run the thing all the way up and then it would drop it 20 millimeters and then it would run it all the way down because it had to find out, just like any of the power windows, uh, what is all the way up and what's all the way down and you know, how it needed to operate because you, you don't want to have to be watching that window while you're doing that, you know. So they wanted it to be able to do it autonomously, but the motor had to be initialized and that's how you did it. Now, one time on this Toyota, um, it wasn't a Camry, it was the Avalon, this maintenance man had, uh, we did some work on his, and I forgot what it was. We did something to the sunroof or something. What the Sam Hill did we do? I can't remember what we did, but anyhow, we replaced something, or we had a battery terminal off for a long time. I can't remember what it was. But he came back and he said that his sunroof wouldn't work. And so I went and looked that up, and it turned out that until you reinitialized all the windows on that particular, I think it was an 07 model, Avalon, you had to reinitialize all the windows, and until you did that, the sunroof would not work. But after we reinitialized, used the procedure to initialize every window motor, then the uh, sunroof came online again, which I thought that was an interesting way to do that too. Um, and I think my son's uh, Toyota... Corolla, it's a 2020 model. I think whenever you have a check engine light that comes on on that one, the cruise control stops working until you get that check engine light fixed. <laughs> I may be wrong about that, so somebody correct me if I am. Anyway, no, the mode door directs the air output. The blend door controls temperature. The max research door determines the air input source. Make sure you're working on the right actuator. Don't change the wrong one, and don't try to wing it. Make sure you read before you wrench. And this is a short one, but I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me today. This is the season for air conditioning. And so, uh, you know, this is not a comprehensive course, but it gives you a few ideas. And I appreciate y'all watching.